in the midst of her explanation, uh, she always said to me, you must never feel that you are less than anybody else. You must always feel that you are somebody, and you must feel that you are as good as anybody else. And, of course, this came up with me in spite of the fact that uh, I still confronted the system of segregation every day. Was that a, a, a violent conflict in your life? If you really believed your mother, and yet the system around you suggested that this wasn't true, it must have set up some sort of strain. Yes, I think so. I, as I look back over those early days, uh, I did have something of an inattention. On the one hand, my mother uh, taught me that I should feel a sense of somebodiness. On the other hand, uh, I had to go out and face the system, uh, which uh, stared me in the face every day, saying, you are less than, you are not equal to. So this was a real tension within. Now, out of your own personal experience, the only example you've given me so far is one family where the mother didn't too much care to have you play with her children. What were you really prevented from doing as a child that a white child might have done? Well, in my uh, days in Atlanta as a child, there was a pretty strict system of segregation. Uh, for instance, I could not use uh, the swimming pool so that uh, for a long, long time I could not go in swimming until uh, the YMCA was built, a Negro YMCA, and they had a swimming pool there. But certainly a Negro child in Atlanta could not go to any public park. Uh, I could not uh, go to the so-called white schools. There were separate schools. And I attended a high school in Atlanta, which was the only high school for Negroes in the city. Uh, and this was a real problem because in Atlanta there are more than 200,000 Negroes. In many of the stores downtown, to take another ex example, uh, I could not go to a lunch counter. Uh, to buy a hamburger, a cup of coffee, or something like that. Uh, I could not attend any of the theaters. Only uh, there were one or two Negro theaters. Uh, they were very small, but uh, they did not get the main pictures. If they got them, they were two years late or three years late. So that, uh, by and large, there was a very strict system of segregation, and uh, there was nothing called racial integration at that time in Atlanta. Now, that's a description of the system. Was anybody actually cruel to you or violent to you because you were colored? Yes, uh, we did confront some of those problems. Uh, I remember as a child seeing uh, problems of police brutality. And uh, this was mainly aimed at Negro children and uh, Negro adults. Uh, I can remember also uh, the organization that is known as the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, this is an organization that stands on white supremacy and uh, an organization that in those days even uh, used violent methods uh, to preserve segregation and to keep the Negro in his place, so to speak. Now, I can remember seeing the Klan actually beat uh, Negroes on some of the streets uh, in Atlanta. But nobody ever beat you personally? No, I never. I did have one experience, uh, which was a relatively minor experience, but it still uh, lived with me a good deal. When I was uh, about eight years old, I was in one of the downtown stores of Atlanta, and uh, all of a sudden, someone slapped me, and the only thing I heard was somebody saying, uh, you are that nigger that stepped on my foot. And uh, it turned out to be a white lady. And, uh, of course, I didn't retaliate at any point. I finally went and told my mother what had happened, and she was very upset about it. But uh, at that time, uh, the lady who slapped me had gone, and uh, uh, my mother and I left the store almost immediately. Can you remember at this distance of time uh, why you didn't uh, respond in any violent way? Was it that you'd already thought of nonviolence, or was it that you just didn't dare as a Negro to, to take any strong action against a white? Well, I think probably it was a combination of two things. I hadn't thought of nonviolence at that early age as a, as a system of thought, uh, as a practical technique. 
uh, I think uh, a great part of it was that uh, uh, I just uh, didn't think uh, I wouldn't dare uh, retaliate or uh, uh, hit back when a white person was involved. And uh, I think some of it was a part of my uh, native structure, so to speak, and that is that uh, I have never been one to hit back too much. Well, now, that's all, what, 20 years or so ago, I suppose. Yes. But how bad is the complaint today? After all, the United States has changed a lot. Uh, the Negroes' rights are protected under the law. What exactly, how much has this system changed between then and now? Well, it has changed a good deal. Uh, it is far from what it ought to be, but uh, I can see many, many changes that have taken place over the last few years. For instance, in the same Atlanta, Georgia, which is uh, one of the largest cities in the South, uh, there are some Negro students in formerly all white schools. Some of the parks uh, are integrated, some of the public parks. Just a few weeks ago, uh, about 177 lunch counters uh, were open to Negroes on a thoroughly integrated basis. Uh, I think uh, I could say also that court injustice is uh, not as glaring a reality today as it was uh, 10 years ago. Police brutality has uh, diminished a great deal. So that uh, in Atlanta alone there are many changes, and uh, when I look over the total situation, I can say the same thing. Uh, for instance, when the United States Supreme Court uh, rendered uh, the decision uh, declaring segregated schools unconstitutional in 1954, uh, 17 states and the District of Columbia practiced segregation in the public schools. Uh, but today, all, uh, I would say most of these states have made some move toward integration. Only three states are holding out, namely the states of uh, Mississippi, Alabama, and South Carolina. Yes. So that uh, there has been a great change uh, since say, 1950 or 1945. Now, I can't help following you up at one point there. You said, I think I'm quoting you more or less verbally correctly, you said that denial of justice was less glaring than it used to be and that police brutality had, I think your words were, somewhat diminished. Now, it follows from that that you're not content that the Negro gets justice in the United States as things are at present and you're not certain that the police do not victimize him. Well, yes, uh, uh, I think uh, we have moved on a great deal, but we still face token integration. By token integration, I mean a few Negroes getting uh, justice in a particular situation, but the vast majority still confronting problems of uh, economic insecurity, uh, and social isolation, so that while we have moved on, uh, we only have token integration, and the problem now is to move from, from token integration to uh, overall integration, where it uh, involves more than just a few students in a school, more than just a few lunch counters open, uh, more than uh, gaining justice in the courts in a few situations, but in every situation. You spoke a moment ago about having been thrust forward into this position of leadership. How exactly did it happen? Why are you at 32 virtually the leader of the Negroes in the United States? Well, I started out as a pastor in Montgomery, Alabama, which uh, uh, is a state that adjoins the state of Georgia. Uh, after I finished my graduate work in Boston, I returned to Montgomery to pastor a church. After I had been in Montgomery about a year, uh, we had the problem there of uh, facing many indignities and injustices on the city buses. Uh, Negroes were treated in a very discourteous manner. The bus drivers usually talked to Negro passengers in a very inhuman way. 
Uh, not only that, uh, if one had visited Montgomery, Alabama prior to 1955, December of 1955, uh, he would have seen Negro passengers actually standing over empty seats. Uh, this was because uh, the first 10 seats were reserved for whites only. And even uh, if Negro passengers uh, packed the buses and the other seats and uh, uh, there were no more seats left other than these seats reserved for whites only. Negro passengers could not sit there. So they had to stand over these seats even if a white passenger was not on the bus. Not only that, there were times when Negro passengers got on the buses at the front and put the fare in the box and then they had to get off the bus and board by the, uh, the rear entrance. These were some of the conditions that existed. And uh, on the 5th of December, uh, in 1955, a Negro woman was arrested, a Mrs. Rosa Parks, for refusing to give up her seat for a boarding white male passenger. Pretty soon after she was arrested, the word got around the Montgomery community, uh, and there was a, a spontaneous reaction. Uh, I think I could say safely that uh, more than 99% of the Negro people of Montgomery rose up with a bit of uh, indignation, a righteous indignation, I would say. And this uh, led uh, to the bus boycott. The Negro citizens decided not to ride the buses until these conditions were changed. They asked me to serve as a spokesman and the president of the Montgomery Improvement Association. And from this time, I found myself in uh, a leadership position in the civil rights struggle. And the bus boycott was, of course, a startling success under your leadership. Yes, uh, we struggled for 381 days, but at the end of that, we returned to thoroughly integrated buses, and they are integrated today in Montgomery. Now, what does this position of leadership cost, <clears throat> cost you in personal terms? I mean, do you, are, are you threatened? Do you get anonymous letters? You have had violence, I think, shown to you more than once. Tell us a little what is involved in all that. Yes, uh, I have uh, been threatened many, many times. Uh, there was a time that we received as many as 30 and 40 threatening calls a day. And, of course, uh, I received numerous uh, threatening letters. Uh, my secretary has come to the point now that she doesn't show me uh, most of these letters, but occasionally I come across them. Uh, within the last few days, I remember receiving uh, a threatening letter. And uh, they say such things as uh, this, uh, you, are, you are causing too much trouble in this town, and if you aren't out within 10 days, you and your family will be killed. Now, in Montgomery, our home was bombed twice, and uh, I guess uh, these were the most... Uh, severe instances of violence that we confronted, uh, but even today we still confront uh, threats uh, through telephone calls and, and through the mail. Do you, have you found that the police have been diligent in protecting you, as diligent as they would be with a white leader? Well, in Montgomery, Alabama, uh, they were not. Uh, certainly we got no protection from uh, the law enforcement agencies. Uh, in fact, one of the big problems that we confront in some situations in the South is that uh, many of the mobs and the hoodlums are aided and abetted by uh, some of the policemen. But I must say that uh, this is a little different in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, when we have received threats, uh, when we have had crosses burned on our lawn by the Ku Klux Klan, uh, the policemen have been very diligent in attempting to protect us. So that uh, uh, situations do vary, even in the Deep South. You were once the victim of, of an actual assassination attempt, were you not? Yes. What happened? Well, this was uh, in Harlem. Uh, it turned out to be a demented uh, Negro woman, and she happens to be in an institution even at this hour for the criminally insane. I was autographing books in a bookstore in, in Harlem in New York City, and uh, this was a book, uh, Stride Toward Freedom, that I wrote a few years ago. 
And uh, she came in. I was writing, and uh, I heard someone say, uh, you Reverend King? And I didn't hardly look up. I just said yes. And by that time, uh, she leaned over and stabbed me. And, of course...